Yeah. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Technology for Good Hangout. This is episode number 13. Uh, with me today, I have special guest John Reed. John, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, I'm John Reed. What's going on? I've got you on my whiteboard, Tom. <laughs> Thanks that's, for that, John. My, that's my Twitter handle as well, John ERP. Excellent. And, um, um, I'm the co-founder. I'm the co-founder of a website called Digenomica.com, which launched last May. And what's Digenomica, John? What do you do there? Well, we're we're an enterprise-focused website founded by uh, five grizzled veterans of the blogging industry uh, who felt like there wasn't uh, enough uh, coverage really focused on enterprise issues, but hopefully with a little more uh, attitude and a little more context. Uh, there's so much news flying around and trying to make sense of it is really difficult and on a lot of tech sites it just felt like things things were getting buried underneath iPhone reviews and important stories were going unsung so we decided to try to do something about it and we actually have uh, more folks on board now we pick up a couple more writers along the way but it's been a really fun adventure and uh, could talk about it for a long time but we're not going to we're going to skip that but that's what I do I've been a blogger and you and I know each other through a lot of different capacities but we're both enterprise irregulars which is a pretty cantankerous group uh, itself but uh, another another way of sort of kicking around the industry with a bunch of smart people who disagree with each other a lot <laughs> indeed indeed and Excellent. today we're talking about Game of Thrones right <laughs> oh, I'm in the wrong hangout. Oh, man. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if we can shoehorn it in somehow. <laughs> okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, we'll head into the stories. And uh, the first story I came across was this one. Uh, and as usual with this uh, technology for good hangout, we start with the bad news, get that out of the way, and then hit, in, hit on into the better news. So this news uh, complements of the um, Huffington Post green site uh, from Kate Shepard tells us that uh, on Earth Day, we have reached another scary climate change milestone, and that is that the atmospheric CO2 has been 400 parts per million now for the last month. The first time it went over 400 parts per million was last year in May, and it was big news when that happened. It happened again this year and has stayed that way. It has stayed over 400 for the last month, as I said, and it looks like that in the next year or two, it's not going to go below 400 ever again, or not in our lifetimes anyway, unless something really drastic happens. So that's the bad news. Industrial, uh, in, during the um, Industrial Revolution, 150 years or, or so ago, the average uh, CO2 concentration was 280 parts per million CO2. It's now 400 and rising. So this is, this is what's uh, leading to the climate change we're all observing these days. So that's the bad news. Now we'll head on, head on into the better news. And there was a good bit of news this week out of um, Apple, um, interestingly. Um, and the, the first story that, we, that I came across was uh, their campaign on reducing envir their environmental impact. They have their um, Apple environmental page, uh, which is apple.com slash environment, where they go through a lot of detail on their responsibility, how they're leaving a smaller footprint. You can see here images of their devices, their iMacs, and their consumption when they're in sleep mode. So they've gone from 35 watts down to 0 0.9 watts. Uh, they go into the toxins that don't go into their machines. They go into their recycling, their progress, and so on. And then at the bottom, you have product reports. So you can go into the reports and see products uh, see product reports per device. So every device that they make, um, their, everything from their iPhone 5, their iPods, their notebooks, their desktops, you can get a, an in-depth report on those devices. Uh, you can see their uh, facilities environmental reports, their GRI index report. You can see their facilities emissions reports, their environmental progress, their recycling, their supplier responsibility, the whole thing. There is a crap load of data that they've started to publish recently, and it's all interesting stuff. The, the big takeaway that I've come across from this 
Um, and it, it, it's, it's a problem not just for Apple but for any manufacturing organization is that while they are doing a shed load uh, of, of a shed load to reduce their emissions and while they're uh, at the same time and you'll see this in this next story while they are shrinking the carbon footprint of their data centers while they're doing massive investments in renewables their manufacturing is still 98% of their carbon footprint and that's an extremely difficult one to get down. I mean they, they they're, they're doing great initiatives. I mean, their uh, vice president of environmental initiatives, as you'll see on this page, is Lisa Jackson, the former uh, head of the EPA. Even hiring her sends a message in itself. They've got Al Gore on their board, but they've got Lisa Jackson in an operations role. Uh, they're doing really fascinating things around getting their data centers down to uh, fully renewable. Uh, being powered by renewables. So they're doing amazing things, but they still got that issue where, like I say, manufacturing uh, organizations, they have to hit up on their manufacturing side of things, and that's a difficult one to do. Uh, maybe if they had their manufacturing facilities in Iceland where the grid is 100% green, they might be able to reduce it, but seeing as most of them are in China, they've got a big problem there on their hands. John, what do you, what do you make of this story? Well... <laughs> I think you hit on the, the hard part for them. They've got a manufacturing supply chain that has uh, caused them some embarrassment in the past at certain exactly. points. Exactly. You know? So they've yeah. had to struggle with that part. Uh, I, I will say uh, what jumped out at me were the quotes from Cook, uh, who has kind of taken sustainability on as sort of a personal mission, which Steve Jobs felt strongly about as well. And I think it's good to have that that sort of executive leadership where he's saying things in the story like he said to one shareholder when I think about doing the right thing I don't think about ROI if that's a hard line for you then you should get out of the stock uh, which you know on the one hand you could say talk is cheap but on the other hand you don't really hear that very often um, so I, I like the tone that's being set and I like the transparency of information but it doesn't change the fact that unlike a lot of companies, they're really in the hardware business and that's not going to change anytime soon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's Like I say, unless they can get their Chinese facilities to reduce their impact, this is, this is going to be a hard one for them to fix. But as you say, the fact that they've got the leadership from the top, the fact that they've got Tim Cook on board and driving this himself, it was he who hired Lisa Jackson. Uh, and that, that in itself says a lot, that he personally uh, invited her in for interview uh, after having met her at a meeting the year before. So, uh, you know, when you've got that kind of leadership from the top, it, it says a lot, and hopefully hopefully that means that they'll work on their Chinese facilities next and try and, get the, try and hit on that 98%, which, which is where the real emissions are. Okay. Moving on from there, um, the next story I came across, which I felt was interesting, was, uh, well, there's a couple of stories in this space around renewables. And we can see that there are uh, MIT and Harvard scientists studying how to produce solar power without sunlight. Now, that, that's, uh, the, the, that, that's kind of a misnomer. That title is a little bit misleading. The story is actually about using the sun's heat as opposed to its light to, as, a, as an energy store in a, in a chemical form. So it's not a photovoltaic uh, means of, of, of harvesting energy from the sun. Uh, but it still requires you know, heat from the sun to get the energy in, to store it, and then it can be released later. There have been a couple of um, solar stories where you, you, you use storage. So um, there's one uh, near us here in Seville where there's a plant that uh, has giant mirrors and it, it focuses these mirrors in on a, on a point where it's got molten salt. And that, that solar facility was the first grid-connected facility which was able to generate solar power uh, 24 hours a day. So it looks like this is going to be something similar. It's a different technique, but it's, again, using storage and uh, converting the heat from the sun into energy, uh, storing it and then releasing it as it's needed. And speaking of solar power, uh, there's this uh, great story out of Google where Google have teamed up with SunPower. SunPower, a large American uh, solar company. The, the same company actually who in the previous story about uh, Apple's data centers, this 
facility they built in uh, um, Near, near Reno in Nevada uh, was built by SunPower in cooperation with Apple and now Google are working with SunPower as well and what they're doing is they're rolling out residential solar so Sun, SunPower and Google together will facilitate people with homes to put solar panels on their roofs uh, they'll absorb the cost of it and then they'll take it off the the electricity bill so it's a way of uh, getting rid of the upfront capital cost of putting solar panels on your roof and then getting subsidized electricity as an outcome of that so it's a great way of increasing the penetration of solar um, throughout and uh, as far as I know it, it, the story is on the on the Google website and all, all the links will be in the show notes afterwards so you can see this yourself the, they don't say as I, I assume this is throughout the US I don't think it's anywhere outside the US because as far as I know Sun Power just operates within the, the kind of lower 48 um, John any any uh, any thoughts on this one well I think when when Google gets aggressive with initiatives like this it's always interesting although I will say it it's kind of pocket change for them on some level but one of the big things in our country in the US here is solar is still almost perceived as kind of an elitist activity as far as individual homes are concerned and so I'm a big fan of subsidizing solar to make it much more mainstream so that people don't think twice about getting it and it almost becomes part of how we live as we incorporate solar into our uh, elect view of electricity and power in general and how we obtain it so anything to kind of mainstream it further I'm generally in favor of so yeah know. and it's 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 it, it's interesting as well because this is uh, this is uh, a way of subsidizing it without involving the utilities and uh, yep. depend, depending on the region uh, and depending on the um, the Utilities Commission in the area, um, there can be, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, um, conflicts of interest because some utility companies do not want uh, a lot of people deploying solar. Uh, there's been a big campaign, yep. for example, in Arizona uh, where the, uh, the Arizona Power, I think is the name of the, the, the big utility there, are funding campaigns uh, to uh, scare people off investing in solar so when you have if, um, things like this where the, the the utilities are kind of being taken out of the the funding equation and you've got people like Google and SunPower coming in and subsidizing it I think that's a great thing because as you say it democratizes the ability to roll out uh, home solar yeah there's a comment on the thread that says this is a cool endeavor too bad big energy is working to limit access to these sources in Oklahoma so um, you know, as you said, that's my home state, by the way. Um, oh, well. Always, always a leader in alternative <laughs> energy. <laughs> but, but, but the I I have a feeling of inevitability about this type of stuff as long as it gets underwritten. So I'm encouraged to see this. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, back to the stories again. Uh, and Google again, kind of subsidizing more stuff this time in the connectivity space. We're seeing that uh, Google has rolled out fiber to a couple of cities in the U.S. and is now talking to 34 more cities in the U.S. about rolling out fiber to them. And <clears throat> excuse me. And they're also talking about rolling out a Wi-Fi to those cities where they're deploying the fiber. They're not saying how they're going to do it yet, and this is going to be happening in the next year to two years. So it's not immediate. Uh, this is this is real first world stuff, but still, it's, it's nice to see. Uh, it's great to see. I was talking about the democratization of solar a minute ago. It's nice to see now the democratization of connectivity, and Google are investing in a number of things in this. There's this project Loon, which they have, which uh, they have these uh, large balloons, which in this case have circled the Earth in 28 days, and they're going to use these to roll out connectivity, uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, they act kind of like satellites where they have radio antennas where they can c converse with the ground and, and deploy Wi-Fi that way. And they also um, bought this company called Titan Aerospace. Uh, this was a company that um, Facebook were looking to buy. Uh, and Facebook then went and bought another company called Zephyr, if, member, if, if, if memory serves correctly. Uh, the, the Titan Aerospace has got these drones 
uh, which can because they're because they're covered as you can see there in the photograph they're covered in solar panels uh, they can stay aloft for up to five years apparently and uh, presumably stay in place and then beam Wi-Fi connectivity down so something like this or, or the or the uh, loon or a combination of the two would be fantastic for getting connectivity into places you know for example where a disaster had struck uh, a large earthquake or a flood or something like that uh, and where you know the, the the normal infrastructure had been taken out but also I mean we're looking at a scenario right now where the seven billion people on the planet and two billion of them have regular internet access so there's five billion people there that both Facebook and Google are looking at and kind of rubbing their hands in terms of kind of ad revenue and they're saying you know if we can get Wi-Fi or connectivity to these people you know that gra that seriously uh, increases our, our reach to an, you know another five billion people on the planet and if you look at the five billion people on the planet that they're targeting in the developing world anytime you bring connectivity to the developing world you see massive increases in people's uh, um, uh, quality of life uh, plus their ability to trade uh, better and set up their own marketplaces so um, sure I, I can see uh, some people saying yeah they're doing this just for their own benefit uh, but if they start bringing connectivity uh, regular connectivity to people in the developing world who are who have a difficult time right now getting online that can only be a good thing for those people too what do you say John yeah well the you referred to the first story about Google Fiber as a first world problem, and I think to a large extent that's right. But in, in the U.S., the there's a very concerning merger underway between Comcast and Time Warner, um, and it's literally you know it looks like it will go through. It's not a done deal, but it's literally going to create a oligopoly of sorts, <laughs> um, and 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 a total lack of competition when it comes to the internet, and so. A lot of us are rooting hard for Google Fiber for a variety of reasons and also Wi-Fi. So if Google can do something about that, that's great. Um, but I think these other projects, the Loon and the, and the Titan Drone, uh, are even more in, inspiring, if you will. And I think it's totally fair to say that these are in Google's financial interest. But in this case, Google's financial interest and the, <laughs> the well-being of a good portion of the planet are pretty well aligned. Yeah. Um, like you, I've spent some time looking at how mobile connectivity can uh, change uh, a developing economy and improve opportunity, and there's there's no doubt that it can. So, so I, I'm I'm behind these efforts as reluctant I as I am to come off as a Google fanboy. I think these are good initiatives. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, if if we go back to the stories again. <clears throat> We can see Google again. Uh, we're, we're heading into kind of the security area now, the security area now. And we can see that uh, Google is researching ways to make encryption easier to use in Gmail. Now, uh, we, we all know that there's been issues with security and email in the, in the last 12 months that we've just been made aware of. Um, using uh, encryption in email, something like PGP, is never trivial. Uh, so Google are looking at ways of building it into its Gmail application and this is going to be a tricky one for them just in terms of <clears throat> well they need to be able to read your email to serve you ads uh, which is how they make money on Gmail but if your email is encrypted then they can't read it they can't serve you ads and suddenly they're cutting off their revenue stream if they do this if they do roll it out so I'm not sure how they're going to square that circle and, 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 and roll this out but they're looking into it which is good I mean hopefully they'll come up with something and we'll, we'll get uh, more secure email as a consequence and sticking with security for a minute uh, I saw this interesting article in The Verge and it talks about uh, how it's uh, how sites are now looking to get rid of passwords altogether and this is in an effort to make things even more secure because we've seen how insecure passwords are becoming with all the hacks and, and passwords that are being exposed and this is talking about you know things like using uh, Google has brought out uh, USB key fobs that would allow users to uh, log into their Gmail account but there's this thing called Fido 
and I know well Fido can be a, a, a kind of a joke dog's name. Uh, it, it's also a, a, um, a standard that's been set or brought up uh, to try and get rid of, as I said earlier, passwords and the FIDO Alliance, which is a group since 2012 that have been working on um, rolling out standards so that uh, you can use a, a, an external device that will uh, authenticate who you are and, uh, and, and deliver that identification to all the sites that you visit. So the, uh, the obvious one uh, that they talk about in the article is the 5S, the Galaxy, sorry, the S5, the Galaxy S5, because that has a fingerprint reader on it. Now, the other obvious one would be the Apple iPhone 5S, which also has a fingerprint reader on it, uh, and by most accounts, a better one than the S5. But unfortunately, uh, Apple, when they bought Authentic, which was the organization, the company that, that built the fingerprint reader for the Apple iPhone 5S, uh, Authentic then pulled out of the FIDO alliance, and it looks like Apple are going their own way on this, which is, you know, <laughs> the Apple way. Uh, they're, they're never ones to get into industry alliances, so it, it's a shame because um, I, I think Apple are going to come up with their own solution. Uh, uh, Tim Cook, the CEO, was talking about something like that uh, in an interview earlier this week. He did mention uh, two things that Apple would be coming up with. He didn't mention them by name, but he hinted that one of them would be uh, using the, the uh, fingerprint scanner as a way of paying for things and identifying yourself. And he also hinted that the other thing would be the wearables. So we look out for those later on this year. But it's it's crazy that there would be two standards, the Apple standard and everyone else's standard, but, you know, on the other hand, that kind of is uh, the Apple way. And then the last story I saw in the kind of security space was this one where the San Francisco Police Department are kind of rolling out these what they call bait bikes. So they've got these, in, in an effort to stop bicycle theft, uh, they're putting bikes out throughout the city. Uh, and in some cases locking them, in some cases not, and they have GPS tags attached to them so they can be found, and they've put a big ad in Craigslist saying we have our bait bikes out, uh, and you take them, and guess what, we'll track you down and we'll jail you. So <laughs> it's it's an interesting one, John. Uh, they're, they're trying to um, bait people into becoming thieves so that they can jail them, yeah. Um, wow, there's a lot of ways to slice and dice that story. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if you ever had your bike stolen. I've had my bike stolen many times. I had a, I had a particularly good lock on a, on a particularly crap bike one time, and when I came out of the shop, the lock was gone. The bike, the was, bike still there. was still there. Yeah. <laughs> Getting your bike stolen sucks. You know, it's it's just there's something about it that just it's the worst when you walk outside. It's a nice sunny day, and it's gone. And you're and you just hate humanity with all your might, even though the person who stole it might just be someone who's trying to get somewhere or, or broke. But it, at the time, it's terrible. I, I I mean, I think this kind of stuff. I mean, having DPS locators on stuff you care about is pretty common sense, as far as I can tell. I don't know about all the sort of daring people to steal bikes and stuff. <laughs> um, th there was a line in here about how. That that this the serial bike nabbers wouldn't be shut down by this, um, so I don't know if the really good bike thieves would be able to detect which ones are actually protected versus which ones are not, because the whole idea is to scare them from taking any bikes, thinking that they might all be GPS protected or whatever. Yeah. So anyway, it's an interesting thing. You know, the other two, the I think the other two stories, I mean, it, it it's basically in my mind, about finding a way to use technology to simplify problems and not just grandfather in solutions that don't work anymore. And passwords are clearly reaching a breaking point uh, where something they're going to have to give way to some better way. Uh, so hopefully that's what we're going to see. Yeah. I, I, I mean, when, when Apple came out with the fingerprint reader on the 5S, I was very optimistic at the time. I thought, you know, this is a this is a way of of authenticating who you are, and it's through your phone. So if apps and APIs were opened up to this, 
uh, then it should be able to authenticate you to websites, to uh, payment services, to everything. And you know, Samsung have gone ahead on the S on their S5, and they've got a deal with PayPal. So at the S5, you can make payments just using your fingerprint. Uh, but Apple have shied away from that so far. Now it seems, I don't know, from some of the things Tim Cook was saying, uh, that maybe they are considering going down that route and hopefully they are and we will see that because as, as you say and as, as, as I've said several times before the whole password thing is terribly broken life I've got a um, I've got a, 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 a password management program called one password which is you know quite good there's another one called last password which is you know as good uh, and I've, I've got something like uh, 2,000 passwords stored in there um, it, 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 it makes fantastic passwords and you, you can you can set up a password recipe uh, and most of my passwords are 20 characters or so long in combinations, r random combinations um, of, of letters, numbers and weird characters. Um, and there's no way I can possibly remember them. So I have a, you know, I have a, a version of that application on my phone. I have another version on my tablet. I have another version on my desktop. I have another version on my laptop. And they're all synced uh, through through the cloud. Uh, so as soon as I change the password on one device, it's changed in all devices. So it's, it's, it's really handy, but it's, it's a real pain to set up. And it's a pain that you have to set all that up on all your devices. So uh, yeah, we, we got to find a way to fix that, and hopefully, hopefully we're we're heading that direction. Moving moving on to uh, kind of social network stories, um, I saw that, uh, and, and this was just in the last couple of days. Uh, Facebook has announced this new thing called Facebook Newswire, and it's powered by Storyful, and Storyful are an Irish company. Woohoo! Uh, an Irish company who um, they, they they pull in news on they're, they're particularly active on Twitter they pull in and verify news for uh, kind of journalists and reporters uh, globally and they, they cover stories they get, they get in really fast they, they find sources they verify the, the feed so you know journalists if they sign up to Storyful get you know clean and verified news from them for whatever's happening up to the second and now they've announced uh, they're teaming up with uh, Facebook to produce this page, which is the F Facebook Newswire page, where you know fresh breaking stories appear here uh, as they happen. So it's it's a, it's just facebook.com/fbnewswire. The link will be in the notes. Click on it. If you're interested in following breaking stories, uh, click the like button on the page, and it'll appear in your feed from then on out. So. That, that's that's a nice one, um, and, and good to see that happening. Uh, and then moving into the kind of wearables space, we see Facebook again. Uh, and this time they're after buying an application called Moves. Uh, they're, they're a Finnish company, uh, and it's it's a Finnish company that, uh, as I say, has this application called Moves, which has been a very successful app uh, on on the iPhone. I'm not sure if it's on Android. I haven't seen any mention of it on, on Android, so I suspect not yet. But with Facebook buying it, I'm sure they'll move into the Android space as well. It's an application that tracks your movements. Uh, it, you know, so if you're walking, if you're running, if you're cycling, it's it's particularly good at differentiating between different forms of transport, and it's got geo built in as well, so it'll map what you did where, when you did it. Plus, it also allows add-in applications so it, it's, a, it's a particularly good application. It was a surprise hit, apparently, in the uh, Apple Store last year. And, uh, oh, no, I'm wrong. It's on Android as well. Sorry, my mistake. It has been downloaded more than 4 million times by iPhone and Android users and has millions of users, Facebook said. So Facebook getting into the wearables as well. It looks like Facebook is snapping up anything that they see is up and coming they go in there and they grab one of the leaders uh, in that space and sticking with uh, wearables for a second we've got this thing called the Withings Pulse 02 uh, so Withings had a, a pulse tracker late last summer and now it's got a successor called the Pulse 02 and the Pulse 02 is you know it's a wearable fitness gadget it keeps tabs on heart rate sleep activity that kind of thing but the new one it's called the O2 because it also keeps track of your blood oxygen levels. Uh, and that can be useful for, you know, people who are mountain climbers or 
people who suffer from breathing problems like asthma who need to, to monitor how, how, you know, how their blood oxygen levels are doing. John, the, the wearable space, as I said, it's, a, it's an up-and-coming space. Um, is, is it one that you've been tracking at all? Uh, a little bit. I, I met my first glass hole the other day. <laughs> uh, that, I was one a couple of weeks ago. A friend of mine yeah, gave, me, gave me the glass to try. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, I met, I met my first glass hole. I thought it was a cyborg at first, and then I quickly figured out what was going on. But... Um, I mean, wearables are kind of the future, I think. it's. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of personal experience because it's not something that I don't have an immediate use case for it myself that really intrigues me, but I can't help but notice that a lot of my peers are starting to delve in, and to me, the really interesting aspects are have to do with things that help improve your quality of life, and it's pretty clear that for health monitoring and stuff, there's a lot of exciting applications of this technology that are going to come. Uh, I, I'm always cautious to view Facebook as uh, the white knight riding into the scene. And there's some funny things in this article about funny phrases like Facebook said it wouldn't immediately use the data gathered from the application for targeted <laughs> advertising. <laughs> I love that. We won't immediately do that. Um, we wait a day or two. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But but so so I think it's always important to be conscious of the fact that that these companies aren't doing these things just just to try to improve the quality of life. They they understand that geolocational and, and relational data are going to be incredibly valuable, and and advertising is a big part of of that. And so it's we're going to all have to become experts in navigating obscure settings and changing privacy settings and reading terms of service agreements and really understanding uh, you know what companies are, are getting from this that they can use because they're going to know exactly what's going on with you at all times yeah. assuming you, that could, you let you them. Just imagine you, you, you finish jogging and you get an alert on your phone feeling sweaty fancy a drink. <laughs> yeah and and I think there's a level of personalization that really gets creepy if you if you start to lose control over it. If if you if you know that you've consciously welcomed that into your life, then you might actually be glad. I mean, a, a more interesting thing obviously would be if you finish some bike ride and and you immediately get a ping from a frozen yogurt shop that you didn't know about around the corner with a 50% off coupon attached to your phone with the barcode. You know. Yeah. Um, and so if you've welcomed that into your life, then I think you're going to welcome that kind of technology, but the problem is that sometimes you're going to get sort of uh, confronted with these offers that are going to make you feel like 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 these companies know a little too much about you for their own good, and so I think that's the issue I'm going to be watching, but, but I think wearables are just inevitable. I mean, there was a big story about how Robert Scoble has backed away from Google Glass because he was the infamous sort of early adopter that there was a picture of him in the shower wearing his you know his glasses, That's right. but 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 even Robert would tell you that wearables are the future. It's just a matter of of how they're perceived, and the problem with with Google Glass in particular has been that that perception of 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 elitism that has really backfired and has actually caused semi-violent and violent incidents in San Francisco and, and exacerbated tensions with local tech companies, which is a much bigger issue that Google Glass has sort of fallen into, but. These are the things we're going to have to deal with that are part of this technical revolution. Yeah, change is never easy, and uh, yep. we, we we are seeing a lot of change. And San Francisco is seeing an, a, a huge amount of change, and a, a lot, as you say, of of simmering um, ill feeling towards uh, people who can afford to buy housing there, where uh, others right. can't. It's, and uh, for some reason, and for some reason, it looks like wearable devices are going to become symbols of that in some cases. So it's just something to think about. But I do think, in general, you know, these are positive things. I don't think I want them embedded underneath my skin, but but <laughs> but around my wrist, if it can help me to make better sense of my fitness and health, then sure, I'll probably give it a try at some point. Yeah, and there was there was an interesting one I mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, where Apple got a patent for. Um, sensors that you build into your earbuds. So you can imagine going jogging, putting in your earbuds, and then it keeps track of your heart rate, it keeps track of your blood oxygen level, it keeps track of you know all those kinds of things. So uh, 
you know, some people might already have a watch and not want to get another one, uh, not want to get one that, you know, looks like that when they have a fancy one. Um, so if, if they got something built into the earbuds, then, you know, that's something that a lot of people wear anyway when they're out walking or running. So it, it seemed to me like a particularly sensible um, idea. Uh, whether it comes off or not, I don't know, but they certainly applied for a patent for it recently. We'll move on. And <clears throat> talking about uh, transportation, um, we talked a couple of times in the show about the kind of whole connected car world. And the issue around connecting cars is always, you know, do you have your car on Android or do you have your car on iOS or BlackBerry, as he shudders, or Windows Phone or, you know, what's the situation? And different manufacturers are lining up and producing cars that go one way or the other way. You've, uh, you know, you've got the... Uh, Apple have brought out their CarPlay technology, and a lot of the manufacturers are lining up behind that. But the trouble then is if you buy a car with CarPlay and you decide in a year's time that you're going to change from iOS to Android, do you then have to sell your car? Um, so it's, or, or do you have a, a car that's no longer connectable? So it, it's interesting to see this story uh, in, in the Network World publication uh, talking about Jaguar Land Rover showing off a partnership with Bosch Softech, which has developed this thing called InControl, which is a smartphone interface and allows both iPhones and Android phones to display apps on the car's infotainment system. So it, it seems like a very nice kind of way around the issue of which camp do you fall into and what if you change camps in the meantime. So that, that's an interesting story. Um, and then the other big story in the transportation world that I saw this week was how Volkswagen are spending 25 billion on putting six different electric vehicles model, electric vehicle models into China by 2018. They're putting both not just sales and distributor and dealerships, but also putting manufacturing in there. Um, so uh, they, they've seen uh, the, the rise of the middle class in China and they they figure they're going to get in there early and get a you know a jump start on the electric vehicle uh, market in China uh, and they're spending 25 billion in order to do so. Uh, John, the, the transportation area, as I said, two kind of stories there. Any any comments on either of those? Well, I, I'm just really encouraged by the success of of. Uh, it feels, I don't know if you agree, but it feels to me like Tesla's success has really changed how electronic vehicles are perceived, and we've reached this critical mass now where even big car manufacturers are, are looking at moving ahead in various capacities with this, and you have to consider this encouraging, I think, and so I'm really happy that it's coming, not just in a begrudging manner now, but, you know, because for a while it almost seemed like, all right, we'll do it because we kind of feel like we should or we have to, but now I feel like there's a real business opportunity that's driving it. Yeah. So that's yeah. really encouraging. No, I totally agree. Uh, and I think you're right. I think before now, people kind of thought electric cars, yeah, they never really take off. But yeah, Tesla just kind of blown everyone out of the water and shown that it, it can be done. And it can be done well. And it doesn't have to be a compromise. Quite the opposite. It can make, they can make a real good car. I mean, the, the Tesla car... Uh, uh, according to several reviews, is kind of one of the best cars that's ever been produced. And it, you know, in the end cap safety tests, it's done. So it, it's not just the 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 best and most reliable car. It's also in terms of safety, the safest car that's ever been produced as well, according to the the end cap safety tests. Well, I think what's interesting is is how in certain areas, anyway, electric cars and also like s very small like uh, I don't want to say uh, Euro cars, but you see more of these in Europe. Uh, but cars that are you would not typically see on American roadway are much more common now, and it, it's almost become like a status symbol in some communities to have these cars, and that's kind of a cool change of pace because in the past it was always like uh, you you were considered kind of a freak if you if you did it, and now in towns you see charging stations, and so it's nice to see that this is going to happen internationally as well. Um, one quick comment on the other story: I, I just can't imagine you'd want to buy a car that was aligned with either Apple or Android only because, you know, just seems, what a pain in the butt. I mean, yeah, exactly. so, anyway, so just it'd be nice to, if, if automakers would get it into their heads that 
You know, you, you don't want to align yourself with simply one no, you have to make manufacturer. It just just a lot easier to swap out a swap out a phone than a car in a lot of ways. Yeah, and you're going to change your phone, you know, every one to two years. Whereas you're probably not going to change your car. You know, um, the the car I'm driving at the moment is uh, I, I bought it six years ago, and I've no plans to change it anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll move on. And <clears throat> uh, I saw a couple of uh, nature-based stories. So this is a cool story from the Mother Nature Network on seven high-tech tools to try and make poaching extinct. I think that's probably, again, a misleading headline. The chances of making poaching extinct are slim, but at least it's making it more difficult for the poachers. And you've got things like using drones, using GPS collars, using alarm fences, hidden cameras, DNA tracking, anti-snare collars with emergency alerts, uh, embedded GPS chips as well. So, so some interesting technologies there being deployed to try and save endangered species from poaching, which is always good. And then uh, I saw this one uh, with this terrible picture of a dead bird, <laughs> or at least yeah, an nice one. <laughs> Hope no one's eating at the moment. Uh, but there is this um, myth out there on how uh, wind turbines are dangerous for birds. And if you subscribe to that, or if you've come across that, then you really need to look at this graphic. And this graphic uh, is the number of birds killed and the things that kill them. So if you look at the top, you've got wind turbines and there's no visible line there. It's so small, it's not really visible. Underneath that, you've got communications towers, uh, so large antennae, for example. After that, you've got pesticides, vehicles, then cats, then high tension lines, and then buildings and windows. So. If you think wind turbines are a danger to birds, then you'll also be campaigning against communication towers, pesticides, vehicles, cats, high tension lines, buildings and windows as well, I guess, and even more so in the case of buildings and windows. So <laughs> I think I think we can shoot down that myth right there. And, and the, the, the data from this uh, comes from the US Forest Service. This is not coming from you know the American uh, Wind Manufacturers Association or anything like that. No, this is from the US Forest Service who would have an interest in you know keeping birds alive uh, and no interest in wind turbines. So uh, yeah, wind turbines, not a big issue for birds. Or if it is an issue for birds, there's a lot of other issues you could hit up first before, you know, before arguing against wind turbines. We'll move on to the Internet of Things, and there's this great application called IFTTT, uh, If This Then That, which is what IFTTT stands for. Uh, it, it launched, it, it's a great application for kind of daisy chaining together different services online. And it launched on iPhone uh, a couple of months ago and really well. And uh, in this last week, they're after launching on Android as well. And on Android, they've got even deeper integration uh, with the operating system than with iOS. And that's possible because uh, Android allows more uh, access to the core than Apple does. So that seems really cool. And if we then look at uh, Microsoft and Satya Nadella, um, Satya, uh, the, the new CEO of Microsoft, and he's announced this new uh, jump into the Internet of Things space where he's looking at uh, a new version of SQL Server, SQL Server 2014, which will have in-memory technology, a new service called Microsoft Azure Intelligent Systems Service that will host Internet of Things applications and a new analytics platform as well, which combines SQL Server with Hadoop. So, John, this is this is the enterprise space, John. <laughs> I'm oh, sure you have an opinion on this. <laughs> what yeah, do you well, think? Yeah, well, um, Satya Nadella is, to some extent, still in a honeymoon period. He's only been on for like 70 days. Uh, he's done quite a lot of stuff because he launched Office for iPad, which in and of itself was a pretty big deal. Um, he re even released a free version of Windows, which at the time was somewhat unheard of. Mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, uh, they screwed up the XP thing from, that gets back to security, that's one other story. Um, but it does appear to be a more open, more imaginative Microsoft, which is a more interesting Microsoft, and 
I'd much rather see Microsoft trying to figure out how to advance the Internet of Things than to uh, add more unnecessary features and menus to Microsoft Word. So um, this type of, of focus is encouraging to me. Um, with the Internet of Things, I think we're obviously very very much caught up in the hype festival around what that actually means. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that that uh, that when certain kinds of objects can communicate more effectively, it's going to help help your quality of life. How that translates into business and how companies can make sense of all that data are fairly enormous problems that are not easily solved. So um, when you hear these new announcements and these new products, then what you're doing is you're then waiting to hear about actual use cases where customers are stepping up and saying, yes, we had a lot of success with this and it actually worked for us financially because that's sort of the bottom line that these announcements don't get into because a lot of the tech press is actually covering the announcements, not the results. Because yeah. the announcements are sexier, but the problem is that a lot of this stuff never sticks to the wall. Uh, but you certainly can think of a lot of scenarios where having more intelligent uh, devices is going to make a big difference in, in your life. Uh, you know, and not just for convenience, but, you know, I mean, to me, one of the, the great Internet of Things stories is, is airplane luggage, right? Uh, wouldn't it be great if your luggage could talk to you and tell you where it was? Um, <laughs> and when it doesn't arrive, you know. Um, where it is, of course, there's, you know, it's easier said than done. I mean, that's not a simple thing, but you get the idea, right? There's times where the fact that you can't speak to certain objects creates a lot of problems. So, you know, I'm generally encouraged by these kinds of announcements, but I have to take a wait-and-see mode to them as well. Sure, yeah. No, I mean, uh, when I started first uh, looking into smart grids, for example, that was back around 2006 or so, I remember postulating at the time that there would be white goods, you know, your dishwashers, your washing machines, your tumble dryers, these kinds of devices, ones which were eminently movable loads, you know, so that you could have them uh, be connected to the net, have them listen in for real-time electricity pricing, and then adjust their behavior so that they operate when electricity is cheapest and therefore greenest, because, you know, while, while it's not necessarily intuitive, but when electricity is cheapest, it is also, it has the highest green content. Um, so, uh, you know, you, and I say they're movable loads because in most cases, uh, when you put on your, your dishwasher, you don't actually care when it's done. You know, you put it on at nighttime after you've finished having your meal, and as long as everything is uh, clean the following morning when you get up, you know, that's, a, that's maybe a, an eight or a ten hour window. Uh, whereas it only takes maybe an hour to do. So any time within those eight or ten hours, as long as it's done, you don't care. And if it's an optimum time, then the machine has got the intelligence to do that. So those kinds of things, those kinds of services are going to be enabled by this, and that's great to see. Uh, we'll move on. And we're in the home stretch on the miscellaneous stories now. <clears throat> and still with Microsoft, we see that Microsoft is bringing out this Office Mix preview and the uh, this 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 is an application which is kind of a a mix uh, to 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 use the name itself uh, of PowerPoint and several other uh, things as well, so that you can mix things in with your um, your PowerPoint presentation. And I can see this, and they they kind of mention it in the article. I can see this having a lot of use in the education area. Um, and the kind of things they talk about in the article are where you have a presentation which you put online for your students. If you're a teacher, uh, you build in extraneous elements, and then you build in uh, surveys or uh, pre you know exams, if you want, questions at the end for your students. Uh, you can follow the progress of your students through the presentation and through the exam at the end. So. Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, uh, you can do that kind of thing with Google Forms as well, but this is kind of a taking it a step further. So it's it's only a preview at the moment. It's not a product, but it, it's nice to see. And I, I, I can imagine a lot of teachers, for one, or people who want a cheap LMS learning management system, l looking this up and trying it out. Um, some other uh, news as well. I, I was a big user, and I think you were, John, as well, of 
Google Reader. Um, and there was an application for the Mac called Reader, uh, or e e d e r. And there's now a beta of Reader version two available on the Mac. It's a public beta, so you can go and download it and try it out. I've tried it out. It's not bad. Uh, it's missing a few bits and pieces, but for a free beta product, it's 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 a nice to try out anyway. And uh, they're going to be adding more to it before it becomes a for sale product. Uh, asteroid impact risks underappreciated. I can see this making a great movie. Um, in fact, it has made a couple of great movies already. Well, great is another word, but a couple of big movies, shall we say. Um, but there is this uh, video at the, at the top of this. And what it does is it scrolls through the different impacts that asteroids have had on the planet over the last 10, 12 years. Actually, over the last 14 years, it's between 2000 and 2013. I've just, I've just seen here, um, and what you don't realize is that there are actually quite a large number of asteroid impacts on the planet, uh, and we don't know about them because a lot of them either break up, up in the atmosphere, or when they when they land, they land uh, like this one here, which is a big one. Uh, this is a kind of 10 to 20 kiloton of TNT. And it landed in the middle of the Indian Ocean, so you know, <laughs> probably hit a plane on the way down or something. But you know, it 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 just it, it didn't impact on us because it wasn't over a built-up area. So what they're talking about in this is deploying a large um, satellite um, out into space. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's going to go out into space. It's going to go out close enough to Venus, and it's going to look back. And they need a specialized satellite to do this because it it it, it'll, it, it has to pick up a black objects against a black background, which is just not easy to do. And the idea is that it would give us warning well ahead of time. Uh, it's called Sentinel, and it would give us warning well ahead of time of any potential issues with us with asteroids coming towards us. The idea then would be that it would be possible to just kind of uh, if you had a year's warning, for example, launch a device, and you don't need to blow it up or anything dramatic like that. You just need to, to nudge it slightly. If it's a year out and you nudge it slightly, it'll go way off and won't come near us. So something like that could be quite useful. It is happening. It's going to be made. It's going to be launched. So it, it's well worth reading up about. Uh, Google has introduced a time machine into its street view. Not sure how useful this will be. Uh, but it allows you to kind of go back in time and street view view things as they are today and how they were uh, several years ago. Uh, could be interesting in a couple of things. They have one here, for example, of the Howard Theater in Washington, what it looked like in 2009 and then in 2012 after it was renovated. Uh, and they've got this building in Singapore, uh, what it looked like in 2008 when it was being built, and then a more recent photo. So, you know, things like that, you know. Uh, reasonably interesting. I don't know that there's going to be huge use for this, but it's kind of a nice to have. Now, graphene, if you've not heard of graphene, it's a one atom thick carbon uh, sheet, which people are trying to make uh, in kind of commercial um, uh, quantities. And a group of Irish re researchers in Trinity College Dublin have come up with a way of producing large amounts of graphene uh, using, according to this, nothing more complex than a domestic blender. Um, it, it, it's been uh, since graphene was discovered in 2004, uh, and two researchers got the Nobel Prize for doing that. Um, researchers have been struggling with a way to produce large amounts of it in, in, in you know, commercial quantities or at commercial scale. And according to this article, the, these researchers in Trinity College Dublin have found a way to do that. Um, and it's, it's a wonder material. It's incredibly strong, incredibly flexible. It's a conductor. It's got all kinds of potential uses in places like batteries, in places like, um, oh, I've, I've forgotten some of the other applications, but they're myriad. Uh, so uh, if if this turns out to be the case that uh, these Irish research researchers from Trinity have come up with a way of producing it commercially, and it seems they have, uh, then we could start to see the rollout of graphene in large quantities, and it could really change lots of, of things, everything from uh, broadband connectivity to battery life and phones to electric vehicles to all kinds of spaces. And then finally, the last story that I came across 
Uh, it's not a new story. I think I've mentioned it one or two before, but uh, I just bring, I'm just bringing it up, and it's, it's featured on Green Monk, uh, my own site. I'm bringing it up because uh, SAP have opened this sustainability and business innovation open and free course. It's it's available online. Uh, the link is in the article, um, or you can just do a search for uh, SAP sustainability course, and that'll that'll bring it up quite quickly as well. Uh, the, the, the great thing about it is it's a massive open online course. It's free. Uh, it's a six-week course, which will lead to a certificate at the end. Um, the course content is outlined here. But the thing and the reason I'm bringing it up now is that the course starts on April 29th. So four days' time the course starts. If you want to sign up for it, go over to the site, sign up for it there, and jump in and join the course. So far, when I checked yesterday, there was 9,200 people had already signed up for it. So that's great because it'll mean there'll be a good community in the forum there, and you won't be, you know, in you won't be alone. So I was on a, on a, on a course last year, a, a an intro to data science course in uh, Coursera, and there were uh, 50,000 people in the course. So it meant that there was fantastic interaction between people in the fora. So similarly with this, there are nearly 10,000 people signed up for it. There'll be a lot of interaction there. Uh, it, it'll, be, it'll be a way to share knowledge as well. John, any, any comments on those last couple of stories before we wrap up? Uh, well, the, the, the next uh, great Asteroids movie I see will be the first. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> But as far as uh, SAP is a digitomica partner, so uh, but I that doesn't stop me from criticizing them. But I actually like a lot of what they're doing with the open online courses, and I'm actually very encouraged to see enterprise software vendors doing these because, honestly, Tom, this is a way better uh, investment than like a traditional marketing campaign at this point. Um, instead of telling people how great you are, give them something really meaningful that can change their careers and. This sustainability course looks like it qualifies. I have a hard time keeping up with the MOOCs that I've tried myself, but but I still think they're fantastic, and a lot of them are available on demand after the fact too. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and and I'm always encouraged to see RSS readers uh, resurface, like the reader has for the Mac. Um, I'm a huge news blur guy. That's because I curate content uh, in my news feed, my Johnny RP news feed, and uh, I use a newsreader for that, and it's honestly, it's my portal to the internet. I love being on my newsreader where I have piped all my feeds, and it's the one place I feel like I really control how I view the internet now, because most of the time when I'm online, if I'm on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, I might like some of the things about those sites, but I never feel like I really control the environment. Um, so I'm a huge fan for anyone who's trying to sort of filter and make sense of the of the uh, world of business and technology to create their own environment to consume content. So, cool. Yep. Yeah. Likewise. Likewise. I I'm a big news reader myself, and uh, yeah, I was really annoyed with Google for turning off for shutting down Google readers. So, uh, I'm interested to see this uh, reader for Mac app, and I, I've I've started using it. It's quite good. I also use Feedly as well. Uh, yeah, so, Feedly is a good one. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. Okay, uh, we've come up to the top of the hour, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call it a day for today. Um, it's been a good show. Uh, thanks a million, John, for for joining me and being the guest this week. It's 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 always fun to have a chat with you, and it's always fun to have a guest on the show. So combining the two is a is a, a win all around. Thanks for that. Yeah, pleasure. Actually, we did get one comment that I that I missed. It's just more of an elaboration, but. Uh, Chris, Chris Kernigan mentioned to you that uh, New Scientist had a story last week that half of all the new electricity in the world is renewable. So thanks, Chris, for chiming in. Sorry I missed that earlier. Nice one. Uh, and, uh, and maybe Tom will have that article out for you for the show next week. Teaser. <laughs> there's, your, there's your official tease, Tom, for next week's gig. Thanks for having me, man. I had fun. Thanks, John. Thanks a million. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, this show is recorded. It'll be on the website. Uh, all the notes will be there as well. So uh, have a good one. And we'll be back next Friday afternoon or morning U.S. time, same time, same bad channel. See you then.